If I got into crypto at the peak of the 2014 bull market, I would have given up on crypto for a few years. Mm. When did you decide to go all in? Um, 2017, at the peak of the bull market. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Chao Wang, a founding partner of Alliance DAO, the leading Web3 accelerator and founder community. He was also the founding head of product at Masari, one of the biggest names in crypto as an aggregator of information, data, and research. What is your mission? We just want to find the best founders in crypto and help them build products that people love. For a lot of people who stuck with crypto, the first moment of magic is price go up. Absolutely. <laughs> what is a great crypto investor? And there's two types of investors, those who are humble and those who will be humbled. Some of the best <laughs> founders I've worked with are extremely contrarian. They question the consensus. The traits that I look for in a founder, autism is almost a requirement now. What happened with Bitcoin was very similar to Ethereum, but in the end, the Bitcoin core community had a critical mass of people who believed in it, and that was the one that really survived. There's ability to take risk and there's a willingness to take risk. I've always had a strong willingness to take risk, but the ability to take risk was... We were never rich when I grew up. We were actually objectively probably in the bottom 20% of the society. I, I've always been not able to take as much risk as I wanted to because of the financial situation of my family. I really wanted to start a startup, but at the back of my mind, I, I always thought about my parents. Mm -hmm. I could not let them down. Ciao. One of the things you talk about is integrity, right? Why is integrity the absolute most important quality that a world-class founder must have? Um. 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests, and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Ciao. It's been a while with... Actually, I've been following you for a couple of years. As I said before, discovered you on Real Vision. And I was just thinking this guy is like special. For me, the alpha in crypto is the just finding the signal through the noise. And there's a few people like Chris Berniski or you, right? Who I'm like, oh, when I listen to one podcast, I can tell, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been following you for a while. And then I just texted you. And Appreciate here it. we are in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. What is your mission? Wow. It's a... Uh, it's a <laughs> As a first question, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised. Um, what's my mission? Um, for work, um, we just want to find the best founders in crypto and help them build products that people love. And it's very simple. What about life? What about life? Uh, I don't know yet. I'm still exploring. Who are you? Who am I? Um, I guess I'm just a guy with, uh, I have a big family, you know, my, you know, obviously my wife, two kids and, but also my parents who live with me and then my in-laws who are like 10 minutes away from me. And then a, bu a bunch of, uh, adjacent, uh, extended family, uh, nearby. So, um, a lot of my life is just, uh, just hanging out with my family outside of work. Is it something common in the culture to live with your parents or what's the... It's not, I don't think it's common. Uh, it's also not really practical for most people, but um, the way it happened is uh, by accident. Uh, I, uh, I had my first child since COVID, uh, well, shortly after COVID. And then I, w I was in New York at that point with a small family, uh, just my wife and, and that's it. And uh, I needed help uh, for, with my first child. And my in-laws had... Uh, <laughs> happened to be in where I live now, which is Atlanta for uh, like, like 10 years. And uh, so I went to Atlanta to get help and then had stayed there since then. And then later I moved my parents from Montreal to, to Atlanta. So my parents have been in Montreal for like almost 20 years. Uh, by the way, I grew up in Montreal. Um, 
because I've always wanted to be at least close to uh, my parents. It's been a goal for like 15 years. And then since I graduated and it finally happened. You wrote that the most persevering people I know all have a massive chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. They always seem to have something to prove no matter how much success they've already had. Mm -hmm. Many have endured early life trauma. Mm -hmm. Both Musk and Jobs notoriously were raised by an abusive father. Mm -hmm. What's your childhood story? And did something happen that can explain your level of success in life? Um, first of all, I don't think I experienced that much trauma in my childhood. Uh, I think my life so far has been pretty smooth. It's been a, a smooth sail so far. And um, I think I've gotten lucky twice in my life. Uh, the first time is being born to a great family, to a great couple of parents. And they taught me a bunch of things. Um, we were never rich uh, when, I, when I grew up. We were actually like objectively probably in the bottom 20% of the society in terms of like income. Uh, I, you know, we lived uh, off of, um, you know, the Canadian government social welfare, welfare program, uh, paycheck to paycheck for uh, many years. Um, but my parents have always told me that no matter what you do, uh, no matter what happens to our family, we'll always send you to university. Mm. We'll always pay for your tuition, which by the way, I paid a lot from, uh, from my own tuition for, with, uh, with scholarship. But anyway, that's a different story. But parents is the first time I got lucky. You can choose. You can mm. choose your parents. Uh, but I got extremely lucky there. Uh, the second time I got really lucky was my wife. Uh, I met her uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, sorry, 2000, 2013. Uh, July 4th, 2014. It was uh, um, the um, uh, July 4th party at my rooftop and I met her. And I uh, started dating a year later. But the, the reason why I say I, I got lucky with my wife is because I think she's just really understanding of uh, everything I do, really supportive. Um, she has her own career, um, her own um, ambitions. Um, but at the same time, she really took care of uh, me and, and the kids. And I would not have been here without her. So you think it's impossible to get really far on your own? Oh, I absolutely think you, you can get really far on your own. Mm. But for me personally, um, well, let me tell you some of the, the, uh, the, I guess some of the impacts that, that my childhood experience have had on me. So I think one of it is that uh, I, I've always been not able to take as much risk as I wanted to because of my background, because mm -hmm. of how the, the, you know, the economic, the financial situation of, of my family, mm -hmm. not being able to take as much risk, but even then I, I still take more risk than the average person by being crypto. Like obviously by being into crypto really early shows your, your risk level of risk affinity, but I, I've always wanted to take even more risk. And what prevented you to do so? Is well, it like a, it's something always, in your mind that yeah, is always risk like averse. A, what would happen to my to my parents if I mm. if I were to start a start startup in my you know uh, in the early days you know right after college if I if I wanted to I, I really wanted to start a startup um, but my family like at the back of my mind I, I always thought about my parents mm -hmm. um, so I got a pretty uh, safe job safe job a Wall Street finance job which pays really really well at that age. Uh, and, uh, what did you do? I was a trader. Mm. Uh, I was a quant trader. Uh, quant trader is actually different from like, you know, the TA trading stuff that you see on crypto Twitter. It's very, mm. very different. It's writing software, uh, very low level distributed systems, which then led to like my interest in, in crypto because that's also low level distributed systems. But anyway, uh, quantitative trading is building a lot of um, software and it's the PNL is really, really consistent because you're able to trade very often like you have a statistical edge mm. uh, in the market. That's how you were able to make a decent amount of money at a very young age. Um, so that's what I did. So going back to tying everything back, mm. I got a job in quantitative trading instead of starting a startup. But 
back to your question earlier, uh, can you go really far without your um, significant other? Obviously you can, but in my case, um, how I was able to later, after the, the finance job, to, to go really deep in crypto, both from investment and professional point of view, uh, it was basically my wife who gave me this support, both financial and psychological support, to take even more risk. So I think risk taking is uh, your, your ability. There, there's ability to, to take risk and there's, there's a willingness to take risk. And mm. I've always had a strong willingness to take risk, but the ability to take risk was, I think a lot of that had, had to do with, with my wife. Where do you think the willingness to take risk comes from? Is it something innate? It might be innate, it might be, it might be nature, it might be nurture, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Or do you think it's the, it, I mean, there could be kind of double-edged sword. like one side is your parents gave you so much confidence or self-confidence yep. because maybe so much love that you feel like you're capable of like anything. Or on the other side, you had such a tough childhood that you want to take risks because you want to prove some things to people, right? I didn't have a tough childhood at all. It was, we we're just financially slightly, mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom quartile mm -hmm. or something, but I had a really great childhood. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've, honestly, I, I don't really know if my drive is, comes from just the DNA or, or was it something that my parents did to me? <laughs> I don't know, I have no idea. You said, Um, you were working in finance and then that's kind of how you got into crypto. How did you get fascinated by the crypto world? Uh, well, like most people, it was originally the volatility of the market. So back in the day when I got into crypto in 2012, the volatility was way, way higher. Like people today on crypto Twitter cry when the market goes down 5%. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it was like 50%. There was literally a day where crypt like Bitcoin went down more than 50% in a day. I think that was 2011 or something. But at that point, I didn't buy any. I was just, that was the, the kind of market that, that got me curious. Mm. So I started paying attention. Uh, it's volatility of the market. But there was a, a very concrete point in time when I realized, I started to really understand the value proposition of crypto was, uh, I was a trader and I really like, uh, I really liked uh, low risk, high return, very consistent type of, Uh, trading strategies. And one of them was arbitrage between betting, different betting platforms, mm. which later le leads me to pay attention to poly market, by the way, we can talk about that. But back in the day, I used to arbitrage between different betting markets around the world. A lot of them were offshore. And that is really important because when you wire money to an offshore betting platform, um, the IRS does not like it. The banking system does not like it. So there was a point where I was, I was making decent money by doing these arbitrages. And at, at one point I wired my entire net worth, which wasn't much at back then, but it was like $20,000. And that's above the 10,000 IRS limit. Mm -hmm. So I wired my entire net worth to a bunch of uh, offshore betting exchanges and it got stuck in the banking system for <laughs> half a year. <laughs> and that was when I realized, holy shit, I need to buy Bitcoin. Mm. And then I, The, 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 as soon as I got the $20 back, I, I, I sent, I wired that money to this random bank in Japan, uh, which is behind Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox, yeah. <laughs> What happened after that? Uh, and then the price started going up. That was, <laughs> for most people, that's <laughs> actually the, it's the opposite, right? They're like, finally, I got my 20K back. Then they buy, it goes down 50%. So, so I, I think, <laughs> I think you, you can get really lucky by just being at the right time because For a lot of people who stuck with crypto, the, the first moment of magic is price go up. Absolutely. You got richer, <laughs> period. If I got into crypto at the peak of the 2011 old market or 2014 old market, uh, I would have given up on crypto for a few years. Mm. When did you decide to go all in? Um, 2017, uh, at the peak of the bull market. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, before, 17, before 2017, not only the majority of my net worth was in crypto, but also uh, in 2017, I decided to put my time, professional time, into crypto as well. That was building Masari in mm. late 2017. 
I recorded a conversation with Thomas, one of the co-founders of Camino last week in mm -hmm. London. And he said that one of the person who was the most supportive to them and helped them keep their conviction in the Solana ecosystem at the bottom when Solana crashed to $8 post FTX crash was you. Yeah. Marius loves me. I love you too, Marius, if you're watching this. <laughs> How did you know <laughs> that the, that Solana would come back when everyone was completely depressed? And maybe you can explain us, you know, you said you, I started 2017, go all in. Yeah. What did you learn along the way that made it almost a no brainer in November, 2022 yeah. to, you know, you're, we're not talking only about you and your own portfolio. We're talking about, I mean, And your own money, we're talking about you telling other people, hey, like, stay there. Yeah. Um, I think there is a story well before 2017. That was the DAO hack, the Ethereum DAO hack. So the collapse of FTX in many ways was, to me, it, it felt really similar to the DAO hack in 2016. So the, for, the, uh, for those who don't know, the DAO hack was... Uh, uh, a bug in the Ethereum... Or not a bug, a bug in the in one of the dApps uh, called the DAO, which is a dApp that, that was built on top of Ethereum. And there was a major bug in that uh, set of smart contracts and it got exploited. And uh, so much money was exploited that I think it was about maybe 10 to 20%. I can't remember the exact number, but it was a very significant percentage of the entire total supply of ETH that was stolen as part of this hack. And It was such a big deal that to the point where the Ethereum community split. Mm. And not only the community split, but the co-founders even split at that time. So, for example, Charles Hoskinson, mm. the co-founder of Cardano, IOHK, blah, 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 a long list of, of, uh, of names. He split uh, to create, or he left to create, uh, among other, among other, with other people, um, Ethereum Classic. Right, uh, Bear Silbert is another example who uh, wa was part of uh, Ethereum Classic, whereas Vitalik and some of the Vitalik uh, close friends were uh, sticking to Ethereum, mm. like the, the 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 real Ethereum was Ethereum Classic. So there was a split in the community, and th and I said to myself, um, there's a really high risk for Ethereum, the project to fail because of the split in community. Um, and people were shattered, people lost money, but also lost conviction. Um, but I saw a small group of developers that were so passionate about Ethereum that they kept building on top of it. They kept um, building applications, sticking with the community, et cetera, et cetera. And that point was, uh, almost exactly what I saw in Solana post FTX. Despite everything that happened to Solana, there was a small handful, call it maybe 50 serious dApp developers slash entrepreneurs um, that were so passionate about Solana that they wouldn't want it to leave. And that was what gave me the conviction that Solana is here to stay. And you don't see that anywhere else in any other chain since Ethereum Solana. That's so important. So as, as an investor and founder, we often work with, uh, by recognizing patterns, which is exactly what you've done there, right? Do you have other bad moments in your career that could be crypto or non-crypto related that actually helps you build the conviction to stay in Solana after FTX? Or there was only one data point? Because um, I think the most important thing for people here is exactly that, is to understand. I mean, first, there's no luck involved is, hey, look, he's been in the, in the space for a long time and you have to be able to recognize pattern going back to many years. And then obviously you're never going to be certain if it's the right call, but you can maximize your chances because you are analyzing patterns, right? Yeah. Is there other moments that were kind of similar? That yeah. enabled you to... There, 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 there must be others. I mean, the, the general level of abstraction is that uh, crypto networks, including Solana, Ethereum, et cetera, Bitcoin, you can think of them as a, a, a living being. And this living being has uh, 
has a critical mass of, of people involved. As long as you're above this critical mass, then you will survive. And I saw, I saw that with Ethereum. I saw that with Bitcoin in 2017 with uh, the, um, the, the Bitcoin civil war, right? Like the, uh, what's it called again? Um, the uh, Segwit, the Segwit so okay. drama in 2017. That was, again, it was very similar to Ethereum in that there was a split of the community. But in the end, the Bitcoin core community had a critical mass of people who believed in it, then that was the one that really survived. Whereas the other one, the Bitcoin Cash and the Bitcoin Segwit 2X, all that, all these various different communities did not have this critical mass. And there's many products, many startups that aligns like rebacked mm -hmm. that, you know, go through periods of highs and lows, but during the lows, they always had a handful of users that really love their products. And you know that there's something there. Mm -hmm. Like you just know that this product has something really magical about it. And, and there, there's a, despite the, the number of users or daily active users going down, um, they have like maybe call it 10 to a hundred users that use it every day. And they would iterate on, on, on the product because you have these uh, a small handful of users and eventually they reach the escape velocity. I've just seen this many times in the past. Mm. And Do you have like, examples? Like um, examples of those where there was e enough users and it worked out, but also maybe some where you said, ah, uh, here it seems like there's enough users, but it didn't work out. Um, the one that worked out, uh, I mean, one example I can think of is Tensor. Mm. Um, Tensor is the, the uh, NFT Pro marketplace. And uh, for the first uh, year or two of existence of Tensor, uh, they always had maybe around, call it 100 to 1,000 users. Obviously, not all of them are recurring users. So maybe they've always had, call it 50 users, power users that really love Tensor. But think about it. Like if you're a shoe in, in the, in, put yourself in the shoe of an entrepreneur, you have a whole year, a year or two of no growth, no mm -hmm. traction. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Like what is your natural instinct? Well, it's to give up. It's to yeah. pivot. Yeah. But th they saw some ma something magical about their product. And because of that, they kept on going. And eventually they reached the escape velocity. So that's one example that worked. Um, but unfortunately, there is more examples of, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, just not pivoting fast enough. I think a good insight here is to realize that in the bear market when no one cares anymore, which is probably going to happen again in the future because of the nature of the cycles, you can have, I mean, having 50 users or 20 or 100 can be enough, right? Yep. Versus what people, because people, it's probably a, a bias here where we think of crypto big valuations, right? Because of how the kind of industry is being built, etc. And therefore, big valuation must mean lots of users, right? Even when things don't really go well, mm -hmm. right? But it's really possible or it's kind of common that there is not many users, but you can still achieve escape velocity later on, right? So, so one insight here is uh, it's probably very counterintuitive to people who come, come from a Web2 background, which is that in Web2, when you build a product, like they tell you, you should aim for like 10% week on week growth or 20% month over month growth. And the growth chart for those products that really work are very smooth. Like mm. they grow monotonically and smoothly exponentially over time. But in crypto, uh, the products that work, that people that end up working and people really love actually never follow, very rarely follow that kind of growth trajectory. The kind of trajectory that they follow is staircase. Mm. So they grow and they're flat for a long period of time, then there's another huge burst of growth, and then there's flat again. And there's many, almost every product that people love in crypto are like that. So Coinbase, for example, every bull market, they grow a lot, and then bear market, they're flat or down. Mm. Every centralized exchange is almost like that. Um, most speculative, speculation, enabled crypto products are like that mm -hmm. due to the very nature of the broader crypto markets. But even the ones that are not fundamentally speculative, like Farcaster, mm -hmm. experienced the same kind of growth. They were like flat 
for a very long time or very little growth. And then come December last year, they all of a sudden 10x their user base from like 10,000 DAU to 100,000 DAU. So like even Farcaster, which is not speculative, experienced the same kind of staircase growth. And we just see this over and over again in crypto. You wrote a really great article um, uh, called What It Takes to Be a Great Founder. So before talking about that, we have to talk about what it takes to be a great investor. What is a great crypto investor? In public markets or private markets? Because these are public because I think it, most people can relate much more to liquid investing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the skill set to, to excel in public markets is, has some overlap with private, but it's quite different. Uh, I think what does it take to, to, to excel in, in public? Uh, you want to have a, uh, your, your natural stance towards the world is to question things, mm. is to question the consensus. And that's how I generally operate it. Uh, and I think that's how most good investors generally operate. Um, and, and by the way, this is also, this is true in both public and, and private. Mm -hmm. In any market, you want to have your default stance towards the world is to, is to question things. Um, by that, we, you mean being contrarian? Be contrarian. Right? Question the consensus. Question, qu think about what people say all the time that is, that is incorrect. How do you train at that? I don't know, to be honest. I, it might just be something you're born with or something you develop as a child. So would you say that if you're born optimistic, you might be a better founder? Because to be a great founder, you need to be kind of overly optimistic, almost like having this kind of De, de, delusional yep. sense of self-belief. If you want to be a great investor, you need to be almost cynical about everything and kind of, <laughs> I, I think, how do you, how do you balance both? I think optimism and questioning the consensus or thinking independently in, in a contrarian way, these are, ortho, these are actually not correlated. These are orthogonal to each other. And in fact, some of the best founders I've worked with are extremely contrarian. They question the consensus because the, fundamentally what, what is building a startup is figuring out an insight about the market, about the users that no one really understands. Yeah. That, that is fundamentally the first step to building a, a good startup. And the best founders are always the ones that really question the consensus and figure out something really, really deep about users that no one else understands. So I think that, as a matter of fact, that the best founders and the best investors share the same trait of being contrarian. You're actually saying... Um in the article, right? If you don't have a contrarian take, you don't have a startup. It's not just investors that must make contrarian bets, so must founders. Absolutely. The, the, wor the worst pitches I've seen are the ones that uh, basically repeat what people say on crypto Twitter, especially what VCs say. There's nothing interesting about these. Mm. Naval calls judgment the most decisive skill. He says in an age of infinite leverage, judgment is the most important skill. What is judgment? What is judgment? I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. So he's saying like judgment is knowing, it's kind of like wisdom, mm -hmm. knowing the long-term consequence of your actions. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what, separates great investors from others, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of what we talked about before. Um, when um, I asked you some examples that enabled you to be bullish at the bottom in Solana, right? Mm -hmm. Based on your experience, you're basically building your, and developing your judgment and saying, mm -hmm. oh, look, this is like, I recognize by pattern, something that you could not have done maybe earlier in your career, right? Mm -hmm. How do you develop judgment? Um, by taking actions, by actually doing things. And as a trader, by getting fucked by the market, <laughs> you got to lose money before Absolutely. you can develop good judgment. If you just, if you never take action, 
which in the, in the case of traders and investors is never putting any skin in the game. You'll never learn. The best way to learn is there's two types. Uh, there's a there's a great thing. There's two types of investors: those who are humble and those who will be humbled. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Winshift happens, family. Time to toast our partner Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. I can uh, definitely feel, <laughs> I can, given what happened uh, two years ago, I was, uh, I had Dokun on the podcast. I was very, I had like $7 million in Luna that turned into $5 in two days. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's not, not the only fuck up I had, but it was a pretty good one. So yeah. And I'm not the only one, right? Like, yeah, 100%. So that's a good one, actually. Yeah. I think, I like to think I became more humble, but let's find out this cycle, right? Let's find out. <laughs> you posted a great meme on trading and investing, right? Because that's what we're talking about now. You posted a great meme, one of that Turkish pistol shooter at the Olympics who just wears his uh, normal glasses and gets yeah. the job done and ends up, I think, second, right? Yeah. Uh, silver medal. And then on the other side, there's the Asian dude with the super advanced girl. glasses. Uh, she's a, it's a girl? Yeah. Okay. With the super advanced glasses, probably did not end up on the podium. Yeah. The meme says that the Asian oh, girl- she, she actually won the gold medal. Better. She won? <laughs> ah, okay. Well, then it's, I mean, still kind of, so the, so the meme says that the Asian girl with the super ad advanced uh, lens is the technical analysis trader, right? Yeah. And the Turkish dude is the, with the normal glasses. Yeah is the investor who buys and forgets. Yeah. You want to explain? There's nothing, it's, it's just a meme. There's no insight behind it. But do you believe, what do you believe in the most? Investing or trading? For the majority of the people who take part in the crypto markets, because I think there is some kind of myth to debunk, especially for the new joiners yeah. in the industry, where you think I can just trade and kind of leave my nine to five, right? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not, uh, um, you know, tribalistic about either. I think either could work. Um, there's people who can make a lot of money by holding long-term and there's people who are very good at short-term trading. You just got to figure out what you're good at. Um, in, in the very early stage of my career, I did extreme, extreme short-term trading, like microsecond level trading, like in and out in microseconds. And now I'm doing the total opposite of that, which is holding, like making venture bets and hold mm -hmm. them for like years. Mm -hmm. Either it can work depending on what you're good at. Like whenever I hear people say, hey, you want to be a long-term investor, you know, expand your time horizon. It's just being very tribalistic. You can't like, if you're really good at short-term trading, uh, you can probably make more money than long-term investors when your capital is small. So short-term mm -hmm. trading is really good when you don't have a lot of capital because you can turn over the, the same capital over and over again. You can compound the trades. You can easy. compound it much more yeah. quickly. But if you're a Warren Buffett and you have like a hundred billion dollars, you simply cannot do short-term trading. You are forced to do long-term investments. Maybe to help people know in what kind of bracket they are, what are the key skills? Because you've been both, right? Yeah that are required to be successful in short-term trading and in long-term investing? Again, like, um, you have to question the consensus. I already mentioned that, mm. but also trading fundamentally is studying history. That's what, what it fundamentally is. You look at the patterns from the past and you try to analyze the patterns you try to figure out a pattern that works over and over really, really well statistically over time. And this is true for both short-term trading and long-term. But the difference is when you do short-term trading, you can get feedback from the market really, really quickly, right? Like if you, if you trade like 10 times a day, then probably within a month, you have 300 trades and you can start, you have enough, uh, you have big enough of a sample, data mm -hmm. sample to say whether or not your strategy works. The ultimate one, me being having zero money left. <laughs> Probably not working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas for long-term investing, it's much harder to get feedback from the market because a hundred investments would take like years. 
Yeah. So what do you do? What do you do to study? How do you study history um, when you're a long-term uh, investor? Well, you study history by studying what has worked in the past for some of the greatest investors in the world. I love reading Warren Buffett's, um, his, his strategies, his philosophy, his, the mistakes he, he's made. Uh, you can learn a lot. You can study history by reading what some of the greatest investors have done in the past. How much do you think the kind of old or boomer way of investing applies into crypto? Because there is all these, I mean, it's not only talks, but like if you yeah. look at, okay, maybe last cycle, I had Arthur Cheung on the podcast, yeah. was amazing at uh, getting early into some really great protocol with strong kind of fundamentals, right? Which yeah. was working last cycle, this cycle, we talk about meme coin later, but like this cycle is very different, right? Yeah. Much harder game. How, how, what do you still think about kind of value investing in crypto? So, um, so people think of Warren Buffett and uh, Charlie Munger as, as uh, value investors. But my understanding is uh, they actually evolved their strategy over the last, uh, you know, 90 years. <laughs> They've lived for 90 years. Their strategy actually evolved. Um, in the early days, Warren Buff before Warren Buffett met Charlie Munger, he was a like pure value investor. He, he would be looking at PE ratios and, you know, uh, PB ratios, like, like basically compare the price to the revenue that the company generates. And the lower that ratio is, the more undervalued the company is and the more you want to invest. But when uh, Warren Buffett met Charlie Munger, the latter really changed the former's uh, philosophy of investing. So Charlie Munger said, uh, it's much, much, it's far better to invest in companies, uh, to great companies at fair value than to invest in fair companies uh, at a low value. Interesting. And if you really think about that, that is not, that is more like growth investing than value investing because what, what really, what constitutes a great company is a company that has great cash flow and hopefully grows over time consistently. That is to me more like growth, growth investing mm. than value investing. So if you apply that same idea to crypto, I think, you know, I think Charlie Munger's idea kind of, kind of works, kind of works in crypto. You want to look at protocols or tokens that grow over time and growth could mean on-chain transactions. It could mean TVL. It could even mean, uh, you know, narrative. Attention. Attention, yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not, uh, look, this one is making that much money, but no one cares about it. It's going to catch up. It's, ah, this one maybe doesn't make much money. There is already good attention and there might be even more attention in the future. Therefore, this is the bet, right? Yep. I, I think uh, Warren Buffett got really lucky by meeting Charlie Munger because his original strategy is called, uh, they call it uh, the cigar butt strategy, like investing in companies that are, are fair, not great, fair companies at uh, extremely low price. They call it the scar, cigar butt, a uh, mm. cigar butt strategy. Mm. That strategy worked really well until the 1980s. And then between 1980s or maybe, um, yeah, until the 1980s and then 1990s, 2000s, growth strategy started to work really well with the advent of the internet because yeah. the internet is all about growth. Yeah. So the original value investment strategy stopped working and then it became growth. That, that's when Charlie Munger's strategy started to shine. And it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, there is a finite, I mean, you can argue there is a lot of money printing, but there's a finite amount of capital to be allocated to more and more company being built or more and more token being created, right? And it's where is this money going to be going? And it's probably where there's the most attention and not necessarily the most rational way of saying, oh, this is a good business. I mean, I talked about with Alex Vanevik and many people we talked about Lido, for example, right? Yeah. And many protocols were thinking like this should do so well, but it's not, right? Yeah. And so it makes a lot of sense. It's a very kind of like a very basic way of thinking, which is people bet their money where the, their attention is going and where their kind of excitement is going about the future and not necessarily about the present on how well things are doing, right? Yep. 
like you, even if you think about the stock market in the last two years, the best performing stock in the S and P five hundred, Nvidia, and in Absolutely. hindsight, is such an obvious bet. <laughs> and there was there was no way you could put your money into Nvidia back in 20, 2022, mm-hmm. You know, shortly after ChatGPT, based on fundamentals, based on price earnings ratio or based on price book ratio or whatever those you know old school fundamentals investment strategies yeah you could just make a lot of money by reasoning about ai like you can you could just say ai is going to be the future it, and then it's kind of again think about patterns i mean i was kind of too young but like it's kind of like where the ipod moment or the iphone moment right I don't know what the kind of like fundamentals of Apple were back then, but if you use the product and you're like, this is so good, you might think, oh, now I'm going to bet for the next five or 10 years on that because it's so good. And I think everybody's going to want to love that. Or maybe Tesla, you drive a Tesla, you know, and you say, this is so different. The experience is so good. I remember a couple of years ago saying, which like made me invest in Tesla is because I hear Chamath saying on the TV when everybody was saying Tesla is shit, uh, et cetera, he was saying, Something like you can't deny the fact that once you kind of put your butt in a Tesla and drive it, your expectation of what's driving a car is changed forever in the future, right? Yeah. And when I hear that, I was like, everybody hates Elon, everybody hates Tesla, and Chamath, who is like so smart, is actually talking about user experience and in there, right? Probably a good bet if he says that. Yeah. So it's kind of similar, right? By the, the way, it's, uh, just curious, when you say every, everybody hits you on it, is it a, I feel like every European I've seen, like- A couple uh, of years ago, I was just yeah. looking at the, the, the actually it was American TV, right? Yeah. And they were all against him. Oh, Again, that's because, obviously it's because of the, I didn't understand back then yet, yeah, right? Yeah. I didn't understand the you whole mass now. media. Now yeah. it's becoming more clear, right? Yeah. But uh, it was kind of like a signal of like everybody, like everybody, um, Mass media doesn't like Elon. I mean, now yeah. I understand why, right? Yeah. The whole thing is becoming clearer by the day. It's but like, political. Yeah, completely. But yeah. the years and years, it was 2019. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't understand anything. Yeah. <laughs> Yet. I'm not saying I understand everything today, but I start to smell, right? Yeah. The, the, but what's but what's go, happening go, here, Going right? back to the Tesla example and the, was the iPhone example, the other reason that gave me the conviction in Solana back, back at the bottom was... I just tried the products, yeah. the Solana products. And I started using the Solana products in 2021 for about like for over, over a year before the collapse of FTX. I mean, the products, I mean, the products were pretty janky back in the day, but you knew that, oh, I can now execute transactions in uh, about a hundred milliseconds. Like it feels really smooth. And then the fees are really low. You could just feel that it's, it's going somewhere. It's gonna go like, the, you, you can feel that, uh, the Solana based products are no longer limited by the blockchain. And it sounds so simple, but most of the great investments are that, right? Most you, of the- you start, you're like, I, if I, we, we often say, right? Why do you own an iPhone, but don't own Apple stocks, right? Yeah. So if you love to use something, you're probably not the only one, right? Because we're probably more all more average than we want to admit, right? So it's probably a good sign. But we always think, oh, what's the futuristic product? What's the futuristic thing? And in investing is the same. What do I love? Like think it's right in front of you, right? Absolutely. Um, S- same thing happened with DeFi Summer. I, I, I really love DeFi because you, 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 tr- you can try the product and feel the magic. Mm. And same thing, I mean, there, there were many reasons that got me into Bitcoin, but just sending a transaction with Bitcoin, the first yeah. time you send the tra- transaction was magical. I think in crypto, in all of crypto, there has been two f- fundamentally magical moments, truly magical moments. The first time was Bitcoin, sending your first Bitcoin transaction. The second time was DeFi Summer, when you can do more more interesting transactions than just uh, you know sending a payment mm. with with DeFi because mm. you, you can you can trade mm. like like transactions become two way rather mm. than just one way. You can lend and do other things with DeFi. That was like the second most magical moment. Yeah, I think we called it, uh, I can run a hedge fund from my room, right? Like I can be a nobody. I mean, I remember, I mean, I got wrecked on that afterwards, but I was. I remember <laughs> doing some uh, Biluna Luna arbitrage, right? Yeah. And I was printing like crazy amount of money. And I was like, oh, it's because my cap- Luna capital is big, but I'm making 1.5% every 21 days, right? 
is this too much? Uh, no, hedge funds are able to do that, right? And you start to think the amount of possibilities that are possible for normal people. I mean, the whole thing went to shit, but like, <laughs> at least it's completely new, right? Yeah. Something that you could not do before. <laughs> and, and by the way, this, like, this is one of the biggest alphas for anyone in crypto, whether you are an entrepreneur or a trader or an investor. Most people are just too lazy to try the products. Yeah. They just, it's much easier to scroll to crypto Twitter and see what people say, yeah. like what people are buying, than to actually use the product because the crypto products are pretty janky. But if you can get over that hurdle and just get into the weeds of trying products, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna outperform a lot of people. It's so simple, right? So but simple. So uh, underrated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We talked about uh, kind of the buy and forget strategy. Yeah. Not talking about uh, what you guys at Alliance, but your personal portfolio. Is it what you do? What do you personally do with your crypto portfolio? How do you play the cycle? Um, I mean, the, the vast majority is in the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and Coinbase. Mm. And then occasionally, you know, I do some uh, short term, like, when I say short term, I mean a duration of a few months, kind of like narrative trading rather than medium to long term hold. So I got into with pretty early. <laughs> most, most people probably know. Yeah. And um, yeah, that, that's the kind of short term trading that I do. But yeah, long term, like there's only, I looked at like the top 300 tokens and I looked at the supply to market cap overhang like the supply overhand, basically mm -hmm. what percentage of the tokens have been unlocked. That's a, that's a very important factor to look at. And I looked at um, whether or not those projects have real, you know, traction or, or users that love them. And ultimately, I think the set of tokens that um, satisfy these two criteria, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Coinbase. How do you split between the four? Um, I am... I am overweight uh, Bitcoin and Solana. Why? Um, relative to Ethereum, I, I think Ethereum is overvalued compared to Solana. I'm not saying Ethereum, it, mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm bearish Ethereum. I'm just saying Solana is, by objective uh, metrics, it's undervalued. And also by metrics that only I have access to, meaning the founders, mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs, more and more entrepreneurs are going to Solana than on Ethereum. And in fact, a lot of entrepreneurs are going from Ethereum, that are building on top, on top of Ethereum today are going to Solana than the other way around. So I can see where the puck is going in terms of developer activity. So I'm, I'm overweight Solana versus Ethereum. Bitcoin is just pure product market fit. It's just the best store of value, uncensorable store of value. And no one, will be able to challenge that in, in, in time soon. Do you play markets, market market cycles? Or do you just say, oh, this is my core position. There's the four of them are so big and I understand that I can't outperform a buy and hold strategy. Therefore these four I'm gonna keep for the next forever. I try to play cycles a little bit, um, but it's really, really hard. So I think I actually tweeted about this, but my first cycle, um, I like held, held my positions, Bitcoin, all the way down, um, down like 80%. Second cycle, I sold too early because of my PTSD from the first cycle. Uh, I sold like maybe at uh, 40 to 50% of the peak. Mm -hmm. That was 20, the 7, 20, 2017 cycle. And the third cycle uh, was the, the 2021 cycle. I remember the tweets. I sold uh, maybe 30% below the, the peak. Huh. Um, so every cycle I got a little bit better <laughs> than the last one, but you're, you're just never able to sell the pickle, pickle top. But last cycle, I bought the pickle bottom. I bought within eight hours of the pickle bottom. So you get, you, I mean, I, I got better over time, but it's been like fucking 15 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> very, very long feed, feedback loop. But so, but, but the key thing is, even if I play the cycles, I don't try to sell everything and I don't try to YOLO into everything at the bottom. I sell maybe like 20 to 30% uh, because the, the downside of 
getting wrong on the on the top is you're gonna miss a lot more, right, of the upside. So I tried to sell maybe 20 to 30% at the top and then try to buy double my position at the bottom, if that makes sense. What's the typical journey of a crypto investor through his or her first, second, and third cycle? Typical journey, yeah, like I said, you, you just uh, hold everything all the way down to zero. <laughs> in my case, uh, 80% down. But I got lucky because I, I was only in Bitcoin. I wanted to ask you, right? So you did still the right choice, which is you don't YOLO in shit coins. Yeah. You're able to say, oh man, like I'll, I'll hold all to, to the moon or to the grave, but the, the main coin, right? Yeah, the, I mean, the first cycle, I didn't even understand the other coins. Like there was like a uh, Litecoin and uh, Pure Coin and all that kind of stuff, which I didn't understand. There, there's a coin about uh, DN, decentralized DNS. I can't remember the name. It starts with an M. Uh, and then there's Pure Coin, which, which is the original proof of stake. Anyway, back in the day, 10 years ago, I didn't understand any of these coins. So the only thing I held was Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, Second cycle, I started to buy some shit coins, but even the second cycle, and, and sort of knew that the only th the only coins that were real were Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm. So, in fact, when I tried to sell the top, I sold the shit coins, the long tail of shit coins into into fiat. Into fiat, yeah. That's a very interesting one. You know what's real, right? Maybe last cycle was Bitcoin ETH. Maybe this cycle you can say what's real is Bitcoin ETH sold, right? Yep. Another myth to debunk is how complicated it is to outperform the real coins with shit coins. Even if there is smaller and it's smaller, li lower liquidity, it's actually extremely hard yep. to outperform. Especially, for example, let's take Solana, this, this cycle, right? Extremely hard to perform. Yep. Uh, I had Raul Pan on the podcast. He's saying, I'm just, if someone comes with a shit coin to me, I'm just charting against Sol, right? I'm trying to look at the trend with Bong, a few like, is the trend kind of going up through time? Yep. And maybe it's going up, but you are at the top, right? And at the top, right? So like, I, I think it's different every cycle. Last cycle, it was extremely easy to, to outperform the real coins, but last mm -hmm. cycle was, uh, was uh, the, the greatest asset bubble of all time <laughs> in all markets, not just crypto, all markets. Yeah. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve um, balance sheet went to, I don't know, it just went absurd. So it was easy. Anything you, you bought last cycle would have outperformed Bitcoin. This cycle is very different. It's fundamentally different. And in fact, I, I think it's almost impossible to outperform from this point on a mix of Bitcoin, Solana, Coinbase stock, uh, unless we get the same kind of uh, mass fiscal or mm. monetary policy printing that we did last time, last cycle. So like people always say, oh, are, we're going to get a alt season. Yeah. Uh, alt seasons are, are guaranteed. It's just a matter of when, not if. I don't know if that's going to be the case, because if you really think about what alt season is, fundamentally, how, how do alt, season, alt seasons work or happen? How do they happen? They happen with two conditions. Condition one is you don't have a ton of alt tokens. Condition two is there's a ton of money mm -hmm. because when there's a when there's more money than the number of tokens, then all the tokens can go up. Mm -hmm. But what's happening in this cycle is neither condition are met. There is too many tokens. Yeah. Ten thousand tokens are created <laughs> daily on pump.fun. Yeah. There's too many tokens, too many VC funded tokens as well. And there's not enough money that's injected into the system. So, and, and, and condition one, the number of tokens, there's no way back. It's, it's <laughs> irreversible. It's, the damage is irreversibly done. So there will always have a ton of tokens. But condition two, that might change if tomorrow, the, you know, Jerome Powell decides to print a lot of money. Yeah. I literally had this morning, a friend from Bali with a surfer. It's his main job trying to call me. He's like, Kevin, Kevin, look, I bought this, uh, this coin on Solana. It's, it's definitely a pump fund coin created, right? Uh, market cap 500K. I made 10X already, etc. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like <laughs> that's a, that's a, but it's a good reality check, right? Times have changed. Things are different. 
we might have fiscal stimulus, maybe money printing, etc. But like the amount of coins is is extremely important to understand, right? Which is a massive factor here. But despite that, we still had, I mean, now there is, there's even more coins, right? But we still had some subclasses of crypto that uh, worked out really well. I talked about with before. So one of the kind of sort of contrarian uh, bets in the beginning of this cycle was uh, that's more accepted now is meme coins. What makes a meme coin a great meme coin? Um, at, at, at what stage? Going from zero dollars to a hundred million market cap or later? I think later. Because I think the first stage is extremely hard. It's too hard. Like what makes a meme coin something that could last? A risk adjusted uh, <laughs> bet in meme coin. Define lasting. What, what does it mean for a meme coin to last? I would say at least a cycle. Meaning the uh, market cap needs to be above a certain number over a cycle. I may have, I have some, for example, let's talk about WIF, right? Yeah. You were early in WIF. You can take the whole journey of WIF, right? So from kind of zero to hundred mil and then now in the billions and then maybe even thinking what happens next, right? Yeah. Maybe you can go through the kind of like different part of the WIF journey. I mean, in the, in the early stage, of with or any meme coin, the cycle is a uh, um, there is a cult leader. In the case of with, it's Ansem. Yep. Um, and the meme itself needs to be actually pretty good. So the genius of with is it has a head, um, and and the 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 thing with the head is you can vampire attack any meme, any uh, PFP with that head. Mm. So you can, tomorrow you can add a hat to your Twitter PFP and everyone can do that. So the hat actually makes the meme go viral uh, a lot better than without it. So, so the, the, the actual innovation with WIF is the hat. Um, so the meme needs to be good. There is, needs to be a call leader. And I think these are the key critical conditions in the early stage. And then for the meme to sustain even longer, ideally you get listed on Binance. Mm. Um, and that happened with WIF at around a billion dollar FTV. But that condition is harder, harder and harder to meet over time because uh, exchanges are not going to list every single meme coin on the planet. Uh, in fact, they're, they're getting more and more strict yeah. with listing new tokens, not just meme coins, any new tokens, they're getting more strict. Um, I think these are the conditions. If you think about what happened with Dogecoin, I don't know if Doge had a like call leader in the early days, but the meme was certainly very good, very organic. Mm. It, was, it was one of the most popular internet memes. And then later on, they had uh, listings from a bunch of centralized exchanges. Do you think the meme narrative is over? Because we went through this kind of meme coin craze, right? Mm -hmm. Now the whole market has kind of like cooled down a lot. We had like crazy liquidation a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, crazy liquidation that happened, I'd say like one, once or twice a year, at least in crypto in general. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon. What's outperforming when market pick up again, if they do pick up? It's really hard to say. Mm. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the, uh, I don't think meme coins is a, is a one cycle thing. I think it's just, I think it's always going to be here to stay. Do you still own with? No. Why? At this uh, FTV, uh, on a pure risk adjusted point of view, I don't know if it'll outperform Solana. Mm. I, I, I think ev about everything in, in relationship to Solana, yeah. basically. That's so interesting. And that's so counterintuitive for someone who is new into crypto, right? Because a lot of people might think, hey, like WIF is uh, the main meme coin of Solana. One of the main is kind of like a beta yep. for Solana, like Pepe would be a beta for ETH, right? But it might not happen. 
it might not out outperform. I mean, if the if the market cap of if of all crypto keeps going up, I could see with go up with Solana or probably outperform it. But there's always a risk of things go going to complete shit. Yeah, and then if things go complete shit, then yeah. those meme coins are actually going to zero. You'd rather but have Solana is yeah. here to stay. <laughs> so I'm just taking a risk adjusted own, bet. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Alliance DAO, which we talked about, we will talk about in a minute, incubated pump fund. What did you see that most others didn't when you pulled the trigger on one of today's most successful protocols in terms of re revenue and mind share? Um, so when the team joined our accelerator, they were not building pump on fund. They were building some other products that didn't work out. And in fact, they pivoted uh, at least twice before the uh, uh, the pump dot fund idea, um, so what we, I mean, it, uh, investing at the earlier stage, especially in in user facing products, it's almost always a bet on the founders mm. rather than a bet on the idea. The ideas will almost always pivot. So I saw I saw a high we can tell it was I saw a high degree of autism in the founders, <laughs> and I think. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. I think to be a great consumer facing product <laughs> founder, you need a high degree of autism. I, I think there's causality. It's not, it's not correlation. It's there's causal effect. I think the autistic people are able to think independently and in a contrarian way. And they're not yeah. distracted by the consensus, by what people say on the internet. They're able to sit down and observe. I, I, do, you, I'm, do you think it's a trait that you personally share a bit? I think I have some How, degree. Yeah. <laughs> I do think I have some degree of autism. <laughs> um, I can tell you most of the podcast guests. Yeah. I had some like where I'm not going to give name and I'm like, this person has probably has Asperger. Like it's like next level of autism, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, wow. But like at the same time, they're, they're crazy successful, right? In the, in this field. Like, so definitely. <laughs> So like as an investor, I, I pattern match a lot and it, like I, <laughs> for consumer facing products, I mean, autism is almost a requirement now mm. for me. It, the, the, the traits that I look for in a founder, in a consumer facing product, autism is important. Yes. Ideally, some kind of childhood trauma is, but they never, obviously they never tell you about their childhood trauma in the first two meetings. You need to send them on this podcast. I can go and dig. Yeah. <laughs> I can go and dig. <laughs> I, I will use your podcast as my interview process. Yes. That's part of my interview process. So childhood trauma plus autism. That's the alpha yeah. for the best investors. Because you I think mean, it makes a lot of sense, actually. It takes two things to really succeed, succeed oh. as a founder. Uh, thinking and action. Thinking mm. is autism. Action <laughs> is childhood trauma. You, you want to prove something. Yeah. You have something to prove. And that, that is trauma. Autism is how you think. How do you find that? How do you sense that? It's just like, mm, you're an autistic person. I can feel directly. It's, it's gut like, feeling. Yeah. It's, okay. The more you do it, the, the better you <laughs> get at it. What is Alliance DAO? We invest in the uh, autistic and child. <laughs> <laughs> continue, continue. We invest in autistic. <laughs> we invest in founders who show high degree of autism and the uh, childhood trauma. You do. That's gonna, be a good, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be a good clip. <laughs> I'm being tongue in cheek, but ultimately, <laughs> that's sort of what we do. Amazing. <laughs> Why did you build Alliance? So when I left Masari, so I had been with Masari for three years. Was family had a product. Um, I really enjoyed the zero to one, to one game, mm. but I hate the scaling game. I hate to scale a business from one to like ten. Um, because there is something fundamentally different from zero to one and one to ten. Zero to one, a lot of it is figuring out an insight. Going back to something I said mm -hmm. earlier, figuring out an insight about users that no one else understands, and try a lot of things to get there. I really which, enjoy this game, which often start with a problem that you have. I mean, you wrote down. Yes, and I, I built three companies in my life. It's the same. It's just I have this problem. There's no solution, or there is some solution, but it's not really. I'll just build something to solve my own problem, right? 100%. That's it. I, I, so always tell, I always tell our founders who are in the middle of a pivot, 
just think of a problem that you yourself have. That is the best way to find a good idea because, and here's the fundamental reason why. If you try to develop an idea by talking to other people, most of the time they will lie to you. Of course. The users always lie. Of There's course. no upside yeah. for the users to say, okay, you ask them the question, if I build this, would you use it? There's no upside for the users to tell you no yeah. because they want to be nice. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so the survey, marketing, study, surveys, all these all that studies. is <laughs> is mostly useless. Yeah. But you will never lie to yourself. So you ask yourself, what is a product that needs to exist today? <laughs> but anyway, back to the question. <laughs> Um, I enjoyed the zero to one and, uh, I said, I asked myself, how do I do this 50 times a year? How do I build the white combinator of crypto essentially? Well, no, it's not really that. It's like, how do I experience the, the zero to one game in a variety of topics mm. 50 times a year? Well, the best way to do that is to build an accelerator. How many times a year do you experience that now? 50 times. 50 times. What's the next goal? I mean, if we can scale, great. If we can scale from 50 to like 500, great. Um, but there aren't that many great founders. There mm. aren't that many founders showing high degree of autism and uh, childhood <laughs> trauma. And there aren't that many great <laughs> product ideas. So yeah. um, ultimately the number is driven by the market. <laughs> One of the um, things you guys organize to find more uh, founders with a high degree of autism <laughs> <laughs> is a hackathon, right? Mm -hmm. You choose Luca Nets as a judge for the next Alliance MVP hackathon. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, we're just like, uh, you know, any founder who has built something great in crypto, we'd love to have them as a judge. As an investor in more than 200 projects with Alliance, what do you think of what Luca Nets is building with Pudgy Penguins and now Abstract? Uh, Pudgy Penguins uh, and, and NFT communities in general is very counterintuitive. It's not a traditional business. You start off by building a community, you mm -hmm. launch a JPEG that is, you know, that a lot of people, can, that appeals to a lot of people. And then you start, and then in the case of Pudgy Penguins, you start developing products. So like those toys, Walmart, uh, toys at Walmart, uh, for example, and then they're developing a game. Those toys. Those toys. Those beautiful toys. <laughs> <laughs> and then they develop the game. Yeah. Uh, it's called Pudgy World, right? Yeah. And then um, what else do they do? But, but basically they, they start off by building a community that which then evolves in, into a product. And that is very counterintuitive. That's very uncommon. Um, but you see more and more and more of the of that today. Like for example, like one thing I can I can think of is uh, Brian Johnson mm -hmm. and even Balaji. Mm -hmm. Balaji is like the network state, whereas yeah. uh, Brian Johnson is the, the Dai community. Don't die. They, they both have they both start off as a community, especially in the case of Brian Johnson. He's, he starts off as a community. Uh, a lot of people watch his videos and uh, his content, and then now he's selling products, supplements. That's kind of the new way to build businesses, right? They call it like the next billion dollar kind of community, right? Which today with uh, AI and it's kind of becoming the, the, the barrier to entry to build anything is much lower. So the, the way to go is build a community and then it's going to be valuable forever. And then you can build product around it, right? Yep. So it's, and it's the complete, it's the exact approach of what an NFT project should do. It's not what most of them do, right? But what they should do. Yeah. I actually can't think of many other NFT communities that, that did what Pudgies yeah. are doing. Like which NFT communities are actually developing products? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do you own a Pudgy Penguin NFT? Um, can I say I used to, but I don't have any, I don't anymore. Why? Because the price was going down. Uh -huh. So I paper handed. Really? So you, you, you kind of more had like your trader cap there where you're thinking I can buy lower or you're just thinking. I'm just thinking whether or not it'll outperform Solana. <laughs> Love it. And unfortunately, and this Love is not it. a pudgy penguin. Like, no, no, I understand. Um, um, if I, down to my head, if I had to own 
a JPEG today, an NFT collection, you will be pudgy penguins and probably Miladies. By the way, Miladies is very high on autism. And I, yeah. I fucking yeah. love that community. Yeah. But the problem with NFTs in general as, as an investment asset class is because, because of the very nature of non-fungibility and therefore a very high floor price, mm. it's very hard to attract new capital. And therefore it's very hard to outperform Solana. And you need these conditions, which is more liquidity, right? And more money in the system. But there's already so many tokens, so many meme coins, and then there is so many NFTs and people need to choose that, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but if your goal is to outperform Solana, then why do you hold ETH? Um, there's a little bit of, uh, it's not really for financial reasons. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a... Uh, I'm almost like emotionally married to ETH a little bit because I've been with ETH since the beginning, 2014. Okay. It just feels really bad to to dump everything. Did you buy the ICO? Yeah. Okay. Fair Got enough. Got really lucky there, by the way. So, I mean, I Did understand the, I get, that you don't want to sell. <laughs> I, I, I've been selling for Solana, mm. ETH for Solana, but, um, and I'm almost done selling. <laughs> but I, I just... <laughs> It just feels really bad to, <laughs> to get rid of something you, you've been part of since the beginning. Like for me, ETH is like NFT community now. Yeah, understand. Let's dive a bit deeper into what it takes to be a great founder, right? We talked about before insight, right? You don't have a, con if you don't have a contrarian take, you don't have a startup. There's another one, perseverance. You wrote, it's plausible that perseverance matters even more in crypto than in other industries. Name any other industry that goes through a complete boom and bust cycle every four years or another industry that the SEC chairman makes it a personal mission to annihilate or another industry where all the main characters end up in jail in less than one year. <laughs> I chuckle every time I see tweets like I aged three years in the last 24 hours or I survived the great bear market of... 2022, uh, 20th of uh, November. This yeah. is not an industry for the faint heart, faint of heart. How do you maximize the chances of survival in the bear market as a crypto founder? Uh, the easiest way is uh, you have no skill sets in any other industry. <laughs> you cannot pivot into any other industry. Uh, that is actually the truth for many crypto founders. They just don't mm. have they don't understand any other industry. In fact, in the last bear market, uh, there's a lot of founders that did pivot away from crypto to AI, AI for example. Yeah. <laughs> and these are some of the smartest people. They can pivot into any industry they wanted to. They can, they can become an expert in a new industry within a very short period of time. But as an investor, are you looking for someone who can pivot quickly from one industry to another or for someone who is sticking into that industry? It depends. Like those founders that pivot, some of them are had a good reason to pivot, uh, others don't. Um, like if they want to talk about their new pivot with me, I always question them, what is, what is the, the one insight that you have that, that no one else has? Mm. Maybe it's from a personal experience, like solving your own problem. Maybe it's something else, but it's, it's case by case. There's no one size fit all. But yeah, I'm, I, I was being tongue in cheek. <laughs> Uh, having no skills that is, it, uh, I was being uh, tongue in cheek, but it's also the truth. Right. Um, um, how do you survive in the bear market is, you just really have to love crypto. Mm. You have to love pain. You have to love pain, but also <laughs> you have to love crypto. That's the ultimate test, right? Who is there when everything is going to shit and yeah. everybody is shitting on crypto? We still there building. We still there around. Ultimate test. Yeah, absolutely. Another one you mentioned is uh, having a co-founder. Mm -hmm. How do you find a great co-founder? Because whether in crypto or in startups in general, probably one of the biggest reason why businesses fail is co-founder issues, right? Do you, do you have a co-founder now? I had two. You had two. But, <laughs> but that didn't work. Even out. for my previous businesses. It never really worked. And were they your friends? That's the problem. I 
choose friends and not based on, I mean, again, some people, they choose their friend and work really well. Mm -hmm. I choose like, are you a great person? So you're going to do great. But I was not looking for to fit, to feel a certain skill that I don't have that is complementary, right? But they were your friends. Yeah. So um, we're still in good or, terms, but yeah. didn't work out. Any of them were your past co uh, co-workers? Never. Probably okay. the problem. The, the ideal, statistically, the, the ideal co-founder um, uh, configuration is uh, two people who have worked closely in the past on any project, whether it's co-workers or side projects. The second, bias, the second best configuration is two friends who have never worked with each other in the past, but they trust each other. They know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Mm. Uh, the worst configuration is uh, someone you just met at a hackathon um, or some online co-founder matching platform. These are the, the worst. So, uh, so in terms of like, if I were to rank the things you should look for in co-founders, one is the most important thing is probably trust. Like, and trust comes from past, um, you know, experience working or, you know, just being friends. Mm. Um, that's the most important thing. Uh, oftentimes you find a co-founder that you don't know or you just met. Uh, you have a good feeling about that person, but there's always this honeymoon period uh, between co-founders. And that's typically six to 12 months, I would say. And usually co-founders break up after that six, six to 12 <coughs> month uh, initial hurdle. Um, as soon as thing, as soon as you realize that things are not as easy or beautiful than they yes. you thought they would be, right? When you're when you're not growing, when your business is stalling, that's when the co-founder relationship thing really matters. Yeah. So trust is is the most important thing. But second most important thing is um, I would say some kind of uh, skill set, com like complementary skill sets, which was the problem in your case. Yeah. You didn't find a co-founder who's I guess. I mean, I think like the main thing that I learned is you have to understand what the fuck I'm building, which is hard because you don't know what you're building, right? Because you, you don't exactly know. So what's the actual game in podcasting or data analytics or whatever? And then once you understand the actual game, which will take time because you have to go in there and try, then you can define a few skill sets that are very different. Ah, oh, I actually need to fit this and that and that. Mm -hmm. So that's probably my biggest kind of a mistake. Right. Yep. But also at the same time, if I kind of like try to be kind to myself is how could I know exactly what game I'm playing if I was never in this industry before and I'm just like figuring out on the fly. Hmm. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's how you learn. That's how you learn. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Through pain. I remember my first uh, business, the data analytics one, which I still have today firing my co-founder after like two or three months. And I was crying and I was, I was like, how- He was your friend? Not really. Okay. He was kind of, he was very autistic. <laughs> very autistic, but had no feelings. And he had, he was just uh, uh, trying to do everything on his own and then asking for more shares in the business saying, ah, I brought more clients, etc." when it was not even true. And then you just like end up in the situation, you know, like you're building a business, you're rowing against the current and then it's really hard, right? But then you, you're rowing in different direction in the team, you're like, what the fuck? How is that possible? Yeah. No one told me, but obviously you're 22 years old. They're like, obviously like you thought money moon, right? We are going to solve this grant idea together. And then yeah. you realize, no, that's <laughs> not the case. That's not the case. <laughs> and I was just crying and crying and crying, telling him like, we can't continue. Yeah. Because crying because I couldn't believe that this would happen so early, right? Yeah. But it's a good learning. <laughs> one of the things uh, you talk about is integrity, right? And uh, actually Buffett and Naval Ravikant, they say uh, in terms of picking people to work with, pick ones that have high intelligence, high energy and high integrity. Why is integrity the absolute most important quality to, uh, that a world-class founder must have? Yeah, like integrity is basically, uh, it's a multiplier and that multiplier is either plus one or, or minus one. Mm. So. It, the, the formula is very simple. It's uh, intelligence times uh, work ethics times integrity. Intelligence and work ethics are absolute numbers. They're positive numbers. Mm -hmm. The higher, the better. But at the end, when you have integrity, if you're integ if you have in integrity, it's a positive one multiplier. If you're you have, you're low integrity, you're minus one integrity. Yeah. 
your, your minus one multiplier. So if you're really smart and really hardworking and you have no integrity, then that's actually the, the worst possible. You, you get a huge negative number. That's a, the worst possible configuration because you're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill your cus customers. You're going to kill your investors. You're going to kill your users, your co-founders, your employees and the industry, which was the case of SBF, for example. SBF, extremely high intelligence, work ethics, negative one on the integrity part. Where do you think the negative one integrity part comes from? In his case or in general? I would say in general. Is it something that you could start with good intentions, but yeah. then like things become too big and you lose control and you're kind of like in denial, yeah, which is I, very common for founders being it, in denial, right? It, especially in crypto, it's... Uh, I, I don't. I don't necessarily believe that. Uh, I, I believe that people do change, like, and money changes people. Mm. And and when you get too rich too quick, uh, it can change you. So you don't believe in the money doesn't change you; it amplifies you. You think money can change you? Money can. I mean, I'm not saying in this in in the absolute sense, but from what I've observed, uh, there's a lot of founders and traders who start off. I'll, I'll be very, I might be very controversial here, but Do Kwan, I, I met Do Kwan in the early days. I didn't see him as a, a bad person per se, but I think he just got too rich too quick and he started to make decisions that are bad for himself and, and, and the users. Mm. I, I think that the overnight success, success and the overnight money does change at least the way people, how people make decisions. It changes their utility function. Maybe SBF is the same same kind of person, but I don't know. I, I definitely saw that overnight success changed Do Kwan, for example. I think you wrote right. Warren Buffett said it best. I look for three qualities: integrity, intelligence, and energy. If you don't have the first, the other the other two will kill you. Hundred percent. It will kill you and everyone around you. How do you find out as quickly, as quickly as possible if someone has a low integrity? It's so hard. It's so hard. I still, I try to come up with a question for our accelerator application mm, form to, to get to a sense find of, out, to yeah. find out, but it's so easy to lie. Yeah. Everybody has good intentions, right? Yeah. Everybody's a good person inside. Yeah. You wrote, many people would argue that money and fame are not good reasons to build a startup. Actually, back to your question, the, the previous question, how do you f find if someone has is high or low on integrity? Uh, I learned that uh, because our accelerator's terms are fairly um, low, like the valuation is low. Hmm. We invest at the earliest stage, our valuation is low. That's understandable. But because of that fact, we self-select into founders who uh, are less opportunistic or, or less of the, understand, you know, uh, unethical kind. Because the unethical kind, they will go out and raise a shit ton of money from at a very high valuation. Like they, that's the kind of game they play. Yeah. But we self-select into the other kind, um, who's not driven by that, at least not yet. Mm and really focus on building a product. On that, who are not driven by that yet, right? Many people would argue that money and fame are not good reasons to build a startup. I'm actually not sure if that's true. Yeah. Can you develop? I just, I just felt so many good founders that just straight up, like they, they never tell you, like when you first meet them, never tell you, hey, I'm here for the money. But <laughs> after a while, like they, they start to tell you like the truth. I just <laughs> love it when they tell me, I just want to build. I want a, to make money. Yeah. Yeah. At least be honest, right? Be honest. Yeah. I love it when a founder tells me, I want to build a billion dollar business. Yeah. And I, I was talking with uh, Johan, the founder of Wintermute. And he was also saying like, even for different projects, he was like, you know, as long if you say that you're here for the short term, because they have a VC arm, right? But at least you are honest about it. It doesn't mean it's great, but at least like we can kind of bet on you because we know that you're not lying and you're playing a certain game, right? And we know maybe we have like different kind of quotas on what kind of money we allocate where. And so the most important is kind of like being honest and transparent, which is not necessarily easy. 
uh, link to this last question you tweeted the other day. High historical correlation between how long BTC is stuck in the range and the level of burnout of crypto builders and investors. Yeah. What does this say about the majority of the people who build and invest in crypto? Sorry, say that again. What, what, what does that say about the majority of the people who build and invest in crypto? What does that say? Does it mean they're here for the right reason? I mean, there's the meme in it for the tech, right? Yeah. Or in it for the money. Yeah. But if you really love crypto, as we said before, you're going to be here when it's bad or, yeah. and it's not that bad, it's just a range, right? Yeah. Chill. Like. So what, actually, what, when, I, when I tweeted that, what I was implying was uh, actually either, either the price going up or down, people feel less burnout. Something. Even if the price goes down, people, people feel <laughs> <least> alive. <laughs> People feel alive when the price goes goes down, but when the price just stagnates for months, like just people just burn out, and I can feel it. I can feel it when I talk to people. Like uh, like at the like beginning of the year, yeah, the price was going up. People felt great. People felt alive, and now like I talk to the same person, they're tired. They're jaded, tired. Why crypto hasn't shipped anything good for for humanity? Blah blah blah. I want to quit. Blah blah blah. You can just feel it. You can feel the burnout. What do you but, tell these people? Uh, I tell them that uh, we're going up in December <laughs> after the election. Do you believe in that? <laughs> I think the elections will cause some volatility for sure. I mean, Trump is going to be significantly better for Harris in the short term and probably in the long term as well. In the short term, I, there, there's going to be a 5% price movement the, the night of the election depending how, how, on who gets elected. So there will be some correlation. I mean, what, hap what happens if Trump doesn't get elected? We go down. But either way, like it if we go down, people will feel people. alive. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You wrote something that's not crypto related. It's easy to be great nowadays because most people are weak. Yeah. Can you elaborate? Well, I just think most people, just most people are, are uh, by week, I mean, both psychologically and physically. Psychologically, most people are just, uh, they can't think independently. They're always looking for the tribe, their own tribe. Uh, they're looking for approval rather than the truth. I think that's just being psychologically weak. But that's what most humans are, right? I think that's what most kind, kind of sheep, are. like, I mean, yeah. without being mean. Yeah. That's human no, that, nature. That, that's human nature. Um, most people are followers. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's also some behavior, human behaviors that, that, uh, really emerged in the last like 10 years or so with the advent of smartphones and social media. Um, there's a very strong evidence that smartphones and social media are killing people mm. slowly. Mm. There's much higher degree of ADHD, suicide, depression, anxiety since 2012. And just just the ADHD part. I would be lying if I don't say that it impacted me a lot. And I was talking at the beginning of this podcast a year ago, I was talking to the founder of uh, blockchain.com, uh, Nicola Carey. And he was saying a year ago, he was saying, I'm building this company, things worth like, I don't know, 14 billion. Like, I can't read a text. I can't read an article anymore without, like I can't, Yeah. right? It's a superpower to be able to focus on something for hours. Yeah. It used Without, to be not the case. Like everyone used to be able to focus for at least 45 minutes, but nowadays it's most people can't anymore. How do you do that? How do I try to stay focused? Yeah. I actively limit my time on TikTok. Uh, and the other only social media I use is Twitter. I don't use, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Blah blah blah. But TikTok but is if, just so fun. But even Twitter is extremely addictive and it is. <laughs> but kind uh, of alter, like day day altering. You, you you might argue, oh yeah, but I get some good news on there and I know what's happening. But yeah. it's a bit of cope too, right? Because if you're actually building, probably can spend way less time than yeah. <laughs> we all do. So right? for, for me personally, it's uh, a little bit easier to not get a 
addicted to Twitter because every time I tweet something, there's a lot of toxicity. So I, <laughs> not, there's a lot. Of, <laughs> I don't want to get, I don't want to get uh, criticized more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm, uh, I only spent, I only spent maybe like five minutes tweeting per day and then five minutes reading just because I have natural aversion to, to Twitter. But otherwise Twitter, I think Twitter is a great product. Um, <laughs> TikTok is really addicting. And I, I have a time limit on my iPhone. What do you watch on TikTok? Uh, I watch soccer. Uh, a lot of Ronaldo and, and Messi. Okay. <laughs> the the Ronaldo enough. and Messi tribes are really interesting. They're shitting on each other. Yeah. Uh, tw uh, TikTok is extremely smart. As soon as you have one or two videos, it's like they understand exactly on another level what you want to watch next. And it's just, yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's really good. It's crazy. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I think TikTok is the best product in, in like social yeah. entertainment. An addiction. An addiction. So I, I have a daily limit <laughs> for myself. And what? I turn every app uh, off at 7 p.m. Because I go to bed at, at nine, between 9 and 10. So I need two hours away from uh, any screen time. And you might actually not click on the button where you're just like... Yeah, it just creates... Skip this... Uh, or is there not an additional lock or something? Exactly that. There's an additional one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I probably need that because I have like from, I think 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. until 9 a.m. But I just click on the thing, right? Every time yeah. on WhatsApp call, ah, I'm logged out. Ah, oh, just click on the thing. Okay, it's back on the WhatsApp call. Yeah. No effect. Doesn't work, right? Doesn't work. <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> We have a crypto alpha part. I mean, we talked a lot about a lot of alpha today already, but we're asked um, the guests what their favorite crypto teams are and why. Mm -hmm. What are your two top teams, favorite teams and why? <sighs> That's gonna... I mean, we, we, we invest in like 200 teams. And yeah. if I mention two, that's going to make the other 198 teams really, uh, but, uh, my favorite teams are actually the ones I, I interact the most with. And by the way, there is a high correlation between my level of interaction and their success. There's some causality there and there's some correlation, but I really love the tensor team. Uh, why? I think they're both very high on autism and <laughs> and probably some childhood trauma. I, you can feel it. I don't know their trauma exactly, but you can feel it. You can feel the trauma because they just have something to prove. Just have something to, to prove. And they, they think about products very uniquely. Um, so my, my, so there, there's, um, I, I give a lot of advice to our like product advice, like product feedback to, to all our founders who want my feedback. And um, they're the founders who don't take my feedback. There's a lot of founders who don't take my feedback, but the founders who don't take my feedback are either really, really, really good or really, really bad. Mm. And, and the Tensor team has rejected my feedback many times and they made some really counterintuitive product decisions that in hindsight turn out to be the correct one. Um, I love that team. Your dad, how did having kids change your perspective on life? Um, I think kids are just most magical thing. It's magic. Like my, my daughter is, uh, my, my son is uh, five months old. He's mad. He's like, he's not at an age. He, he doesn't understand anything yet, but my daughter is three and a half and she's like the most funny and interesting human being. I often wonder like if, like how much, um, damage that the just growing up in the society has on your sense of humor and your creativity. Like I haven't seen many people who are funnier than my daughter. She just says things that are just, just really out of nowhere, really unique and funny and humorous. Okay. 
one of the most common messages that I hear from super successful people who come on this podcast is you should have kids as early as possible. And they kind of regret not having kids earlier. Do you feel the same? Um, no, I think I had kids at the right time. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually glad that I focused on money and career uh, in my 20s. Uh, that's, that's, that's my view too, actually. Focusing first on that and then feeling safe is, is, also, is, is actually very selfish, right? You want to stress out less later. Yep. And you want to be able to provide a better life to everyone, right? And also probably be a bit more present. And uh, yeah. There was a study recently that uh, just changed uh, everyone's understanding of, of money and happiness. So there, there used to be a study back in like 10 years ago that um, your level of happiness uh, increases monotonically with your money, but at some point it flattens out. And that point is like, I don't know, 100K or some 150K per annual, uh, sal uh, you know, per year of salary. And that this new study show that uh, happiness and money are actually correlated and there's no upper bound. Of course, the, the scale is is like logarithmic. So like if you double the money, you don't necessarily double your, your happiness. Mm. Uh, I actually, like the, the, re you know, the reason why these two studies uh, show different results, I think it's probably a matter of methodology and maybe sample and maybe they're the author's own bias. But if I had to pick one that I believe is the correct one, I think it's the latter. I think my level of happiness has increased monotonically with, with money. And there's a very simple reason for that is money does re remove a lot of stress out of your life. And I really, I'm really glad that I, I was focused on money and not kids because now I, I get to enjoy the beautiful parts of having kids and not the, the stressful parts. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I've been thinking like that since I'm 23, actually. I was thinking like that. It's, I mean, it's very rational, right? As a man, right? Yeah. Where you're thinking, okay, like maybe we're not, uh, we're not, I mean, as a man, you still have this responsibility, even if like, yes, woman work, etc. as a man, you have this thing in your mind where I need to be able to provide and protect and to be the man, especially when she's pregnant. And maybe if she wants to just take, take care of the kids afterwards. And therefore, like, I'd rather be there afterwards, uh, sorry, before having kids maybe even before meeting my partner, mm -hmm. right? Than after, because otherwise it's going to be so much stress, right? A lot of stress. But money can remove a lot of stress from your life. Yeah. You tweeted positive impacts of crypto on society so far. Bitcoin, yeah. stablecoin, making early adopter rich. So they'll yeah. go on and figure out health and longevity. Yeah, that was, that was being tongue in cheek, but... There's obviously a lot of crypto people who are into longevity. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a and common in fact, pattern. I think out of the fields out of, outside of crypto that crypto people are into, I think longevity is the one <clears throat> that has the highest overlap with crypto people. You don't see a lot of crypto people who are into like nuclear energy or climate or space. Or, I mean, there's a lot of people into AI these days, but the, the OGs are universally interested in longevity. Let's be a bit critical here. Cause I've been talking to a few of these big crypto people and yeah. I've been asking them like off the record, oh, this person begin longevity. And then like, for example, they say, yeah, but they don't even go to gym. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like it's cool to be in longevity, right? Yeah, yeah. I have money and I want but, to live better, not literally longer, but better. Yeah. Right. As, as that, because that's the definition of longevity. It's, yeah. it's not like necessarily live until 200 years old, but it's lifespan versus health span. Right. Yeah. But, but, but that's not a coincidence. If you, had a mag if you had a magical pill that you can just swallow and then live forever instead of going to the gym, of course you pick that. But today, so far today, <laughs> I mean, enough. these people are, are probably very lazy and don't want to so go to the gym, but the science so is un un unequivocal that today, the best drug that we have as humans is going to the gym. That's exactly right, right? So you're thinking that these people who are kind of lazy, they're kind of hoping for that magic pill. Because my definition of longevity is that is okay, I sleep enough, I eat clean. That's my definition. I go to the well. gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> number one for me, in order of importance, number one, sleep, number two, go into the gym. And then work. And then no, and then eat. And the, eat, eat eat clean. Where eat does well. where does work fit into that? For, 
for long longevity purpose for life in general I mean, work, work is important. I mean, there, there's some trade-off between work and longevity because the stress does remove Absolutely. some years of life. <laughs> but there are some positive impacts as well because you get to meet interesting people because like the social interactions is one of the key factors of longevity as well. So there's a balance. But again, I get to say this because in my 20s, I, I didn't get to say this. In my 20s, it's all work, work, work. I, I don't regret that. How healthy were you in your 20s? I was extremely unhealthy. I, I have- my, How bad did it get? Um, my, uh, I don't know if you know ferritin. Ferritin is one of the markers of uh, inflammation. My ferritin is in the 1400s. The average male is like 200. And even the average is, is not considered optimal. The optimal is like 70, 80, 100. Mm. Uh, the people who get their ferritin to like 1400 are used who are, are those who get cancer or some other really bad inflammation. And my entire body was infl inflamed. Like that was, I thought I had cancer. That's how bad it, it got mm. in my, in my late twenties. Um, uh, my cardio today is, I've never been, uh, my cardio today is, is just much better than, uh, I've ever had in my twenties. Are you doing something to help advance the health and longevity space? Uh, I'm making some angel investments here and there, but uh, not that much. What's something you believe in that most people would not agree with? I do have something in mind that I think most people will not agree with in the public, but they will agree with me in, in the private. Uh, I think the, I think that the whole political situation is getting absurd. And I think the, the modern liberals, not the classic liberals, the modern liberals in the last five years, uh, are net negative to society. Do you elaborate? Uh, this whole, I mean, Kamala Harris is basically a Marxist. Period. By definition, he announced. She announced the her her her, her very first on concrete policy I saw that. was <laughs> press controls. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. I mean, there's like that's just uh, absurd. Uh, financial illiteracy. I think most people will at least agree with me in, in private. In public, I don't know because Kamala Harris is a woman and and she's a minority. Mm. So most people publicly will be on her side. Um, that's, that's part of the, something that I, I think, you know, just net negative to society. Um, a lot of the ideology that the modern left, again, by modern left, I mean really the last like three to five years, um, is a religion. It's a religion. It's, it's not, it's crazy. It's absurd. How is it possible that the best person that the Democrats can come up with is financially illiterate and that she might become president? What's kind of wrong about the system that makes it that there's no kind of better options? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an answer. I wish I had an answer. <laughs> If I had the answer, I, I would have. Uh, you would uh, be the president. <laughs> I, I would. I would at least help the, the society to to build yeah. that system. Yeah. But it's crazy that that we end up with uh, the two choices we have is a Marxist and a clown. Uh, I'm voting for the clown because I think the clown <laughs> is uh, will do less damage than the Marxist. Uh, but I wish we had better candidates. I mean, like on both, yeah. both par candidates from both parties in the last couple of decades were better than what we have today. Like I like Obama. I liked even Bush. I liked Clinton. Yeah. Like all these are decent candidates. I've been hearing a lot of, uh, yeah, I'm going to vote for Trump because he's less bad, yeah. but you're not like there's better. It's like less bad. And it's, uh, I mean, when you think that president of the USA is probably one of the most important roles on the planet mm -hmm. and people vote by less bad, <laughs> it shows that there is a, kind of underlying issue. Yeah. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? On anything? Anything. Um, Bitcoin will be higher. 
How much higher? 100K. What's the top of this cycle for Bitcoin? I don't know. The range is huge. What's your range? Somewhere between 100K to 42069. <laughs> because we live in a simulation. I mean, last cycle, we ended at 69,420. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it would be perfect if the next one is uh, 42069. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing that. That was an amazing conversation. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.